By the strike of the clock, it means that this is the exam room live brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Now, let's set the table for today. Inspiration will be our centerpiece. Doctors called it a miracle, but Catherine Lawrence Ireland, she called it plants. Once diagnosed with painful endometriosis that could have left her barren, she turned to a plant-based diet just in the nick of time, literally just weeks before she was set to undergo an operation. Catherine Lawrence Ireland will be here to share her inspirational story with us today. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Hi. And get ready to dive into the science behind endometriosis with Dr. Jasmine Sardana. Dr. Jazz, what do we know? What role do hormones play? And what are the foods that we should be avoiding? She'll be here with the science. Dr. Jazz, looking forward to catching up with you. Thanks, Chuck. And she'll be answering your questions as well. So fire away in the comments section because we will be opening up the doctor's mailbag in just a little bit. She will be prescribing an answer. So make sure that you drop your question in there right now. But first, before we go any further, let's get caught up on what is happening in the world. Here are your health headlines for Thursday, August 20th, 2020. And we do begin with a check on the coronavirus. On Wednesday, more than 44,000 new infections and 1,300 deaths being reported reported in the U.S., pushing the total number of cases now beyond five and a half million and bringing the death, death toll beyond 173,000. Meanwhile, Florida becoming the fifth state to record 10,000 deaths, joining New York, New Jersey, California, and Texas as the only others to reach that milestone. In nutrition news, broccoli and Brussels sprouts are bloody good for your health. A new study out of Australia finds that women who eat a diet loaded with cruciferous vegetables are less likely to develop blood vessel disease. And that is a condition where fatty calcium deposits clog arteries and veins. Researchers in this particular study say the women who consumed 45 grams of cruciferous veggies a day had a 46% lower risk of having the condition. So now you may be asking yourself, well, how much is 45 grams. Just about a quarter cup of steamed broccoli will get you there and a half cup of raw cabbage will also do the trick. Not a whole lot. Studies have previously shown that loading up on the cruciferous veggies can lower the risk of heart attacks and strokes. And finally, a big congratulations are in order for our very own Dr. Jim Loomis and everyone involved with the documentary, The Game Changers. The film star, James Wilkes, says it appears that the plant-powered film geared toward athletes is poised to become the most watched documentary ever. Earlier this year, it already shattered records on iTunes, becoming the platform's top-selling documentary of all time within just a week of its release. Now, Plant-Based News is reporting that with the film available on Netflix and other streaming platforms worldwide, it is showing no signs of slowing down. Moving on. On to today's spotlight, endometriosis is a reproductive condition affecting as many as one out of every 10 women in the U.S. It's often painful and can dash the hopes of those who dream of one day becoming a mother. It was thrust into the headlines this week when reality TV star Savannah Chrisley revealed that she was undergoing a third surgery for endometriosis, and she's only 23. Diagnosed at the age of 18, she says she already feels like her body has given up on her. The beauty queen laid bare in her soul on Instagram, saying that the pain is unbearable, as is the toll it has taken on her emotional and mental health. Now, a quick Google search will tell you that the cause of endometriosis is still somewhat of a mystery, but there is a growing army of women and medical professionals who say diet plays a large role. And that includes my first guest today. Once ravaged by the condition, then doctors declared it to be a miracle when it seemingly vanished. But she says, no, no, this was no miracle. It was her new diet, one that is fueled exclusively by plants. With that, please welcome Catherine Lawrence Ireland to the exam room live. Catherine, th thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm grateful that you're bringing more exposure to this, to this um, condition and the connection really. So thank you for that. 
It's my pleasure. And you and I first got the opportunity to sit down together uh, this past fall. I was actually in your store, uh, your your shop in Dallas, interviewing you because you're featured in Dr. Barnard's uh, new book, Your Body in Balance. And that was really the first time that I had an opportunity to hear your story in its entirety. And that is why I wanted to bring you on the show today, because it is so powerful. And before we get to that, I, I, we just heard about the emotions that Savannah Chrisley was mm -hmm. feeling at 23. I know that you were very young yourself. I'm sure you can identify a lot of what she's going through right now. Yeah, I think so much of it, there's physical pain that comes with endometriosis, but so much of it from a woman's perspective is emotional and mental too. And what does this mean for my future? And will I be able to have children? And, you know, that you go through those questions of, am I broken? And, you know, was this not going to be part of my, my plan for life? It's um, very emotional, I would say, just as much as the physical pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about your inspirational story. Uh, talk about when you first noticed that something wasn't quite right with you. How old were you? What What were you noticing? Well, I was about 27 years old and I had um, severe abdominal pain. Mine actually, I got misdiagnosed several times because my endometriosis adhesions had wrapped around my colon. And so so I started to notice um, more problems when I would when I was digesting food. And so that's why I kept getting misdiagnosed with like diverticulitis and things that that weren't actually what was going on. But I was 27 when it started and it just progressed over um, about a year while we were trying to figure out what it was. So you're 27 at the time, but let's go back a few years. Let's go back to when it was that you were growing up. You were talking about the importance of making that food connection with your story. Yeah. So what was your diet like growing up? What kind of foods were you indulging? Uh, well, I'm from Louisiana, so I grew up on a, a rich Cajun diet, um, lots of butter <laughs> and fried things and just really rich food. And then after that, um, after college, I was in the Air Force. And uh, so I was very physically active. And I think that at that time in my life, being that age and that much physical activity, um, my diet didn't seem to play a big role in my weight at the time. So, so I didn't have those sort of outward indications that I was unhealthy uh, for a while. So my diet was, I used to brag that I didn't eat anything green. And so I, I ate virtually no vegetables, lots and lots of mac and cheese. If you've read Dr. Barnard's The Cheese Trap, um, lots of uh, lots of dairy. I would say I had a very dairy heavy diet and sugar as well. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about your love affair with mac and cheese in just a little <laughs> bit, but I, I want to talk a little bit more about your diet when you were in the service. You say you you boasted about not eating anything green. I would imagine that's a feat that's really easy to accomplish when you're actually in the service, right? Yeah, well, I think um, also it made me feel tougher. You know, I was in a, a male dominated um, career field in the Air Force. And so I think it made me it made me appear, I guess, or feel like I was as tough as the guys. And and um, so I wouldn't be made fun of for making vegetables. I remember there was a vegetarian in our squadron and he got quite a bit of um uh, he just he got made fun of quite a bit. And and so I think there was an association at the time that um, also kind of compelled me to to feel like I needed to to be tough and as tough as them. <laughs> <laughs> Have meat, must eat. Um, right. <laughs> so when you got out of the service, uh, let's let's talk about your love affair with mac and cheese here, because this is what was featured in the book that really has captured mm -hmm. so many people's attention. When you got out of the service, somebody just, I mean, laid more macaroni and cheese blue boxes on you than <laughs> I ever thought were possible. Yeah. yeah. Talk to me, like, what, what happened here? That was my birthday gift was like a case of the mac and cheese um and like the with like the cheese in the packet the you know it's powdered on there and so i ate a whole box by myself um every single day for 48 days and it, it didn't end well like my body i think i ended up with food poisoning or something because i just like my body just at the end ended up just <laughs> violently rejecting it but i mean that was normal i would have several glasses of milk a day i would have the cheese cubes always in the fridge i ate a lot of dairy for the sake of, you know, um, justifying saying, well, I need this for protein and then I need this for calcium and I need it to be strong. I was very, um, 
I was very naive in my understanding of what foods provide that. So I just, I just didn't know. I'd never been exposed to it. Mm -hmm. So at this time, uh, you're out of the service. Is that really when you started to notice things really starting to ratchet up as far as your health declining? I would say over about three or four years because my exercise went down, obviously, and um, and my diet continued. And so um, as I was in my mid 20s and also incorporating um, more sodas and things like that. So I was getting sugar and caffeine along with this very low fiber diet. Um, I think that it just took a couple of years to culminate. By the time I got sick, I was um, about 190 pounds. So I was I was overweight and uh, had some, I was starting to have high cholesterol and high blood pressure that the doctor was talking to me about that we needed to get on medication for. And, um, but it really didn't capture my attention or anything until I was finally diagnosed with the endometriosis and I had ovarian cysts and uterine cysts and it's kind of my whole reproductive system shut down. And so you hear endometriosis as a woman, I would imagine that when you finally get that diagnosis, your heart has to just kind of skip a beat and you get this pit in your stomach. Uh, talk about the emotions of that day. Well, I was, I was upset, but I was confused. You know, I think being an engineer, I'm kind of a data person. And I said, well, is this, is there something I can do? And they said, no, there's nothing you can do. There's no cure for this. And I didn't, I didn't accept that. I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of research about a lot of diseases. And I said, well, is it my food? And because I, I mean, I knew deep down, I didn't take care of myself. And, and they said, no, food has nothing to do with it. And so I think in the beginning, I was frustrated and I, I didn't accept that answer, but um I, you know, I have food addiction issues. I'm very open about it. And so I remember that night I went home and I made a big pot of gumbo and I had some beer and I just kind of eat my feelings. So that's what I did that night. <laughs> and part of me was somewhat relieved when the doctor said, oh, no, it has nothing to do with your diet. There's nothing you can do about this. That completely took away all um, personal responsibility and culpability in it. And so in a way, you know, I was sorry. I felt sorry for myself, but I, I certainly didn't feel empowered or responsible for it at all. Now, were you with your husband at this point yet? No. Mm -mm. Okay. So no, I wasn't married at the time. Uh, so, um, but when, when you did uh, begin to, I guess the question is, when did you meet your husband? That that's oh. let's let's tell the love side of this story here. Oh, okay. So I met him. Yes, we were dating at the time. Sorry. Um, so I met him there. Uh, I was working as an engineer here in Fort Worth. So, um, and he is was from Chicago. And so we had, you know, I was making my Cajun food and then he was doing, I mean, he loves deep dish pizza and brats and, and all that good stuff. And I'm a good cook. So, so I took on that kind of cooking too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but you get this diagnosis and you, he eventually becomes your husband. So you kind of mm -hmm. have the suspicion that he might be the one, but then, you know, the risk of having children with endometriosis, the, the probability of becoming pregnant is low. Did that weigh on you at all? I asked, you know, I asked the doctor when I got the diagnosis. So they said, well, you need a full hysterectomy um, because you're too high risk for endometrial cancer. Your case is too aggressive. Um, you need this full hysterectomy. And I said, well, what, a, you know, what about kids? And, and they said, it doesn't matter. You're completely infertile anyway um, because of all the damage that they could see um, between what the endometriosis had done and my ovaries, um, and all of the challenges I was having, they said that I was, um, infertile. And so I, I was, I was devastated, but I gave up at that point. I didn't, I, I was just ignorant to anything, um, that would help this. And so I attribute, I attribute my healing to my mom. She really, really wanted grandkids. <laughs> so she started researching. <laughs> So is she is she the one then that that really started to try to make that connection between diet and disease here? Uh, she did. I think she randomly heard something on the radio and called me. She um, made me go talk to a nutritionist. I was very reluctant um, to talk to that nutritionist. And as the she was talking to me, this nutritionist saying, you know, educating me on what foods can um, strengthen a woman's immune system or. Uh, 
reproductive system and, and which foods aren't so good for it. I mean, I was shocked. I had never heard anything like that. Um, you know, she asked me to remove meat and dairy out of my diet. And at that point, the only thing left <laughs> would be sugar. So I, I agreed to do it only to appease my mom. You know, I just wanted to tell her, well, I tried everything, you know, while I was waiting for this hysterectomy, I truly did not think that it was going to work. And what she was saying was so foreign to me, like brown rice, for example, I didn't, I had never had brown rice. I didn't know brown rice existed. And, you know, I ate a lot of white rice with my gumbo and Creole and etouffee and stuff. And so, so these were all just completely new foods for me. And I wasn't very open to it in the beginning. Uh, but how long, uh, how long between the time that first conversation with your mom took place and the date that you were scheduled to actually go in for this hysterectomy, how much time was there in between? It was about six weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. So not a whole heck of a lot of time, but no. you were skeptical in the beginning, but did you wind up going all in on this? I, I did it. I, I wanted to be truthful. So I said, okay, I'll do this. Not going to matter. I'll probably starve. <laughs> so I, I remember my meals look ex exactly the same. It was always like a pile of broccoli because that was the only, you know, veggie I was real familiar with and some brown rice and then like a can of beans. And um, so it was very boring and it wasn't, it was very tasteful. Um, I didn't really put my effort into it. And so I ate this way for the six weeks while I was waiting for the hysterectomy. Mm hmm well, you say you didn't put your effort into it, but you took dairy out of the diet, which has been you yeah. know, your love since childhood. No mac and yeah. cheese. That in itself is is a miracle. But then using the word miracle, then let's talk about the actual day of the operation. Walk okay. us through that because the doctor used that term and it is so key in your story. Well, so I went in for the hysterectomy and um, they were going to do an initial surgery just to remove um, some of the cysts and things. And they went in, they woke me up very quickly. Um, I remember afterwards, probably 30 minutes, under an hour, it's pretty fast. And the doctor just had this look on his face that you never want to see <laughs> from your doctor. And he said, I don't know what's happened. About 95% of your endometriosis is gone. He said, you have tremendous scarring. I can see the scarring. And you had some adhesions around your colon I had to remove. And he said, but I'm really not comfortable uh, moving forward with the hysterectomy. He said, this is really a miracle. I have never seen this before. Um, and, and so I was shocked. And my mom jumped in and she said, she said, well, she's been trying this new weird diet, you know, and, and he said, oh, no, that's not it. This is a miracle. And I remember thinking to myself, I was a little bit disappointed. I, um, I mean, of course, I wanted to heal and be healthy, but I thought, oh, my gosh, I'm going to it's the diet. I'm going to have to keep eating this way. And I don't know how, you know, <laughs> so I was a little, I was a little re reluctant. <laughs> well, I mean, your, your dietary choices up until that point had been very limited, but I would imagine coming out of that and then kind of putting, uh, connecting the dots as it were, it probably wasn't long before you started opening up some cookbooks and seeing what other options are out there. Yeah. And there are a million, there are a million. I just never knew. I just never knew to look for them. And, and that's when I really kind of dove into this way of eating and cooking and converting some of my Southern Cajun recipes that way and learning all these new foods that I had never really tried before. Um, and I came at it with a different approach. It wasn't something you know, that my mom was making me eat. Now it was something that was actually going to help me heal my body and hopefully allow me to have kids later. And so it took us about six months um, to completely get rid of everything and all my symptoms. And, and that was when I really, I think it, it really just kind of hit home for me. Oh, okay. This is the diet that my body seems to work best on. When I got sick, I had seven fibroid cysts in my breasts and, you know, Robinette women have those. My mom had them. My grandmother had them. All my cousins have them. So we just thought, well, this is something that runs in our family, right? It's genetic. But after about six months, these, these were completely gone. And that's when I woke up and realized, oh my gosh, 
I'm the, you know, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to have the same fate that the other women in my family have had. They all had hysterectomies around the age of 30 because they had such massive problems. So we're predisposed to it. But what I learned um, through my research with PCRM and Dr. Campbell's work and all that is that, that just because I'm predisposed to it, I don't have to have that same fate. And I have so much more influence um, than I was led to believe that I did. And so after six months, I had lost um, about 50 pounds. I started to get new hair growth, which was incredible at 27. Um, and my cholesterol went down to healthy levels and no longer needed the medication. Uh, same with blood pressure, too. And I just I just felt better. And I looked better. And I, I think part of me feeling better wasn't just physically, but mentally. I felt like I was um, I felt like I was in a healthier place and making making choices for my future um, at, as someone who realized that they had tremendous influence over it. And and you wind up, I mean, talk about going all in. I mean, you make a huge <laughs> career change and now you devote your life to helping others overcome their health struggles through your business, which, by the way, is called Food Saved Me. And I would argue that food didn't just save you. It saved your entire family because you're now the mother of how many children? <laughs> well, I've had three boys. And they're three, six, and eight. And um, the third one was a surprise. My husband is like, whoa, <laughs> needs working too good. <laughs> yeah, That's fantastic. fantastic. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I am so happy for you. And you are, in fact, working with others now, especially during this pandemic. You've taken your mm -hmm. shop online. Yes, yes. Um, I hope you'll check out foodsavemecom It's a great resource for people. I mean, that's really what drives me. I try to empower people because so many women have been in my situation. I've heard from them that they didn't know they had options and they had the hysterectomy and they never had children and their whole life is different because of that one decision. And so on foodsaveme.com, we have uh, free nutrition and cooking classes. We have classes for heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's prevention, food addiction. We also have an immune booster one, which is very popular right now. And then if someone wants to take it a step further than just their food, we also do Salad Master cookware demonstrations over Zoom. I do those. They're completely free. Just teach people about how to test their own cookware to see if there's plastics or metals coming out of it. And I give some tips on how to really cook that food healthier because, you know, the food matters so much. And I think we're just it's such a disservice and it's so disempowering to people when they don't realize their influence. And so part of my mission with Food Save Me is to just educate and let people know, like, here's what you can do. And these foods can change your life. And then how you cook those foods, what you cook them in can also be miraculous. So we're, we're really excited that people are getting more aware of nutrition. I think that's what COVID has done. Truly, one of the good things that's come out of it, I think people are thinking about what can I do at home to protect my family? And, and maybe I should be thinking about my immune system and, and what I can do uh, with food at home uh, to protect us. And so I think, I think this is a really um, exciting time as far as how people are, are opening up to the power of nutrition. Outstanding. Catherine mm -hmm. Lawrence, Ireland. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story with us today. It is just Thank one in a million. And wow, talk about inspiration. Thank you so very much. Hey, for joining it's always us. good to see you, Chuck. <laughs> All right. Be sure to check her out online, foodsavemecom And you can read more about her story in Dr. Neil Barnard's latest book, Your Body in Balance. And then coming up, actually, October 19th, there's actually a three-week course based off of Your Body in Balance with Dr. Neil Barnard, a three-week course on tackling uh, menstrual pain and end endometriosis that begins Monday, October 19th, and it runs uh, through November 2nd. The registration also includes a copy of the book. And the book, by the way, covers so many other things as well. The connection between hormones and food and diet, not just endometriosis, but other you'll so many other awesome stories in there about improving thyroid conditions and diabetes and menopause, hot flashes, metabolism. It is really a phenomenal read. So 
uh, head over to PCRM.org and look for your body and balance there. And we also have a link to register uh, in the comment section right now, I do believe. But right now, let's also take a closer look at endometriosis as we welcome Dr. Jasmine Sardana back to the exam room. Dr. Jazz, appreciate you taking the time here. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Always have what to. A, what a story from Catherine, right? It is, you know, I, I'm so excited to have heard Catherine's story. Um, I'm so excited and happy for the three boys that she was able to have. Um, you know, the other piece of Catherine's story that really struck stuck with me, struck me, and I hope our, our viewers also understand is the disempowerment that she talked about, right? So no, it has nothing to do with your diet. So, you know, there's nothing you can do. Of course, your diet plays, I might be slightly biased, but the evidence is there. Your diet plays such a huge part. And I think, you know, as physicians, as healthcare providers, when we downplay that, we're really doing our patients a disservice. So I'm really glad that Catherine brought that up. Well, let's talk about the role that diet plays. You and I were talking a little bit this morning about the research that's out there on this. And correct me if I'm wrong, right now it appears to be largely anecdotal. There, there hasn't been mm -hmm. a lot of really good, solid research yet on this. Right. Um, so just quickly as background for some of our viewers, um, endometriosis affects about one in 10 women, so about 10% of the population, and it has a wide range of, of, of presentations, right? So there are some women who have endometriosis who are not, asym who are not symptomatic at all, and they'll undergo another kind of um, procedure, maybe a tubal ligation when they're done having children, and incidentally, they find that they have endometriosis. So the prevalence of that you know, asymptomatic endometriosis is about one to 7% in asymptomatic women. However, there's a large percentage of women who are symptomatic um, with endometriosis, and it's more likely to be diagnosed in those individuals who are symptomatic. And the symptoms that Catherine mentioned are similarly pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, uh, dysmenorrhea, just painful periods. Um, and so those who are symptomatic, upwards of 70% of women who are symptomatic um, are found to have endometriosis. And you did mention earlier at the top of the show, Chuck, that we don't really know exactly, we haven't found out exactly what it is that causes endometriosis. It seems to be multifactorial. Certainly there is a genetic component. There might be other pop, you know, reasons why uh, some women are more likely to have endometriosis. Um, and how that starts is endometrium. The endometrium is, is the lining of the uterus. And what happens in endometriosis is that, um, well, each month, you know, with the menstrual cycle, the endometrium kind of builds up and then sheds. Some of those cells move. So ectopically, some of those endometrial um, cells move into other parts of our anatomy, into our abdominal cavity sometimes. And when it lodges in some of those places where it's not supposed to be, it can trigger an inflammatory reaction that, and that causes endometriosis. And depending on where that ends up happening, and that can lead to infertility uh, um, because it causes adhesions. For example, uh, adhesions can wrap around the uh, fallopian tube. So even though you're ovulating, the ovum is not able to get down into the uterus. So that's one a, a little bit of background. Um, so it's actually an inflammatory um, reaction to these endometrial cells that are topically in other areas um, of the abdominal cavity. And that causes endometriosis or how it happens. Um, we heard we heard Catherine say that her doctor say that there was no connection with diet. Uh, obviously, you know you you see things a little bit differently. Uh, I know in particular there was one study, perhaps out of Japan, that looked at, at soy and endometriosis. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So I do have to say the studies are inconclusive, um, and we have to, you know, as a scientist, as a physician, I kind of have to look at the whole as much as I you know, appreciate diet, and I know it's powerful, I want to make sure I'm looking at this, um, you know, the right way. There is a study exactly, Chuck, that came out of uh, Japan, looked at about 138 Japanese women, and they followed them, uh, and they followed their urine studies for these particular um, uh, elements that would indirectly measure the amount of soy that they consumed. And what they found was an inverse relationship between the increased consumption of uh, soy and a decreased risk of advanced endometriosis. So endometriosis 
endometriosis can, again, uh, run the gamut of being mild uh, to, you know, advanced endometriosis. And there was decreased risk they showed in this study of advanced endometriosis, but not of early endometriosis. There's another study that also linked the increased consumption of uh, trans fatty acids with an increased risk of endometriosis. And there was another prospective study that looked at increased consumption of healthy omega-3 fatty acids and a decreased risk of endometriosis. So as you can see, the evidence out there isn't um, completely conclusive. We certainly need bigger and better uh, well-powered studies. But at the end of the day, if my patients came to me, and as they do, and they ask me about how much power or how much of benefit could there be in them eating healthier, uh, a whole food plant-based diet, I will always encourage them to do that with, with you know, the um, part that I let them know that you know, the evidence isn't completely there, but there are things that you can do. And Chuck, I also want to um, make this really interesting point that what we're also seeing is that Catherine mentioned how she also, because of how she was eating, she had high cholesterol and she had these other conditions. There certainly seems to be a link between cardiovascular disease risk and endometriosis, which was really inter interesting. So there was um, a study that looked at about 116,000 women and you know they, they left out individuals who had a history of heart disease or stroke. And then they looked at uh, individuals who were later diagnosed with endometriosis and found that um, individuals who had endometriosis ended up having an increased risk of heart attack, of having to undergo cabbage or stents placed compared to those who did not have endometriosis. So while we don't know what all those links are, we don't, we can understand that endometriosis is a very inflammatory condition and so is heart disease. And uh, eating a whole food plant-based diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. And so that is how it can be helpful. It never ceases to amaze me how so much, uh, so many of these conditions can just be kind of tied together to diet. I mean, we were talking about soy earlier, and and one of the things that we've learned on this show a number of times is that soy is not, you know, this thing that will cause cancer. Instead, right. the science actually shows that it will reduce your risk of of developing cancer. And we know about the benefits of a plant based diet, not just for cholesterol, but hypertension, uh, diabetes, yeah. heart disease. As you were just saying, so many of these different conditions, and they all go hand in hand. Um, I'm curious, though, as we kind of wrap this up. I've always wondered from a patient perspective, how much evidence does a doctor need to say, well, okay, there absolutely positively is something here and this is irrefutable. So we don't have the science yet on endometriosis, but how much and what type of science does the average doctor need to say, hey, we're onto something here? Um, it has to be rigorous. It has to be consistent. It has to be iterative, meaning it can't just be one study uh, in a bubble. It has to be replicated. Uh, you know, those values have to be replicated. Oftentimes what I look to are the um, professional organizations that represent whatever condition it is that I'm looking for the evidence behind. So for example, if you go to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, we haven't seen that data or recommendations coming out from them yet. So that's how I kind of assess um, how much evidence there is. Fair enough. Okay. Let's uh, finish things up today by opening up the doctor's mailbag. This is your opportunity to ask Dr. Jazz a question. So go ahead and tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live or post it in the comments section. I'm going to pick out one right here and it comes to us from Barry on Facebook. Great question. Uh, meat eaters still think that plant eaters don't get enough protein, but how much do we actually need to eat each day? Um, this, this question will never get old, uh, <laughs> every week. I'm happy to, I'm happy to, um, but meat eaters may think that if you're not eating meat, you're not getting enough protein. But when I looked at this recent, so, um, Harvard university has a health blog that I often read. And I loved this quote, which is, uh, you know, don't read, get more protein or get enough protein as equaling eat more meat and chicken and eggs. You know, what you have to consider is that is protein package. So I loved that because, yes, there's animal protein 
But there's also protein that's found in these wonderful plants, uh, plant foods like whole grains, beans, legumes, nuts, and vegetables. And to answer this question specifically about how much you need, and um, on average, a woman needs about 46 grams of protein a day. And on average, men get uh, need about 56 grams a day. And I think what studies have shown is that Americans are getting much more protein than they actually need. Um, and so the important piece there is also to consider the protein package. Sure, there's protein in animal products, but what else is there? What's part of that package? Saturated fats and cholesterol. And if you look at the plant package, protein package, we're not, we're getting the protein, but we're not getting all these other unhealthy parts um, along with that. All right, Dr. Jazz, if we did not get to the questions for you today, have no fear. We will save them and try to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. And by the way, don't forget, you can make an appointment to visit with Dr. Jazz. You heard us say telemedicine uh, earlier in the show, and that is because that is exactly what happens over at the Barnard Medical Center. You can schedule an appointment right now by visiting barnardmedical.org or pick up the phone and call 202-527-7500 and ask to see Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jazz will Sardana, appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Chuck. All right. And uh, before we go, a big shout out to somebody who's watching today. Water Seeds for Life uh, writes in that they are a 25 year type one diabetic, but then they went on a whole food plant based diet a decade ago, said that they used to be super insulin resistant. Their words, taking upwards of 75 units of it every single day. Now, only taking about 30 says all other health issues have disappeared. Congratulations. That is that is just fantastic. Thank you so very much for sharing your success with us here today. And also today, we've got ourselves a brand new episode of the Exam Room podcast that is available. If you head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast from, I had the opportunity to speak with someone who I call the future of nutrition in medicine, Musa Muhammad. He is a medical school student in Canada who is sitting in class one day and has this epiphany. He says, well, why are the professors talking about treating all of these diseases with pills and with surgery? But there hasn't been a word spoken on how to prevent that. So Musamil, he does some research and he learns all about the effect of nutrition there and specifically plant-based nutrition. So he pulls it and he sends it to the administration at the school. They love the fact that he's taken this initiative and now they have actually hired him to review the curriculum and come up with the nutritional component for it. And he is now really the future of nutrition and medicine. It's a great story and hopefully one that will be changing thousands of lives up in Canada. And maybe some doctors here in the US that hear this too will become inspired. So head over to Apple Podcast or wherever it is that you get your shows from, look for the Exam Room Podcast, hit that subscribe button and look for that brand new episode that was just out today. And that's all the time that we do have for this show today. My thanks again to Catherine Lawrence for joining us, as well as Dr. Jazz, Jasmine Sardana, and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the plant-based magic happen. On behalf of everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for joining us today. And until tomorrow, stay safe, take a stand, and 